Denmark and Lawrenceville. I'll just try. I'll set up a. I'll send you guys some some information on Wednesday. So if you're free, come down. It's gonna be eleven to one at night. So okay. And you you said you have a bouncer that's gonna ignore the IDs, or you have like fake IDs that you're gonna hand out on the side as a business. That all of that information I cannot say in this class. Okay. Please don't do that. Please don't do that. Okay, great. Excellent. And we'll have a trip report for if some of you guys make it to that. So, uh, all right. Sorry about taking a little bit of time to get started. I had a bunch of people at the office hours. Uh, but we're going to talk about uh, concurrency control today. And uh, let's just jump right into it. All right. So let's get into this. You've seen this diagram of what a database engine looks like as a modular architecture for the different components. We are going to talk today about uh, concurrency control mechanisms that hit across these different layers, which largely hits the operator execution and the access method layers. In two classes from now, we'll talk about recovery methods, which is at the buffer pool and disk manager layers. Now, all of this will become a lot more clear as we jump into what does transaction management mean? What does recovery mean? So let's uh, go straight to that. So transaction management, allows us to do things safely in a database system in situations where multiple things are getting updated uh, all at the same time. Let's start with a simple example. Here is a, a schematic of database operations. These could be fired through a SQL query. From the perspective of the transaction management component, we are largely going to look at the operations that happen at the object level, right? So imagine we fired up a transaction and that ends up reading an object, could be a record, could be a page. We're just going to refer to them as objects here. In this class, does some checking of that value, does some action like pay, and then updates that A by subtracting 25 from it and eventually writes that. For the purpose of the discussion for transaction management, we are largely concerned with the read and write operations that happen with each of these database objects. You can think of them as records, pages, tables, what have you, it won't matter. Just assume the reads and writes for objects that are in the database is what we care about. And we want to have certain properties about these read and write to ensure notions of correctness as we'll define it, and that's what transaction management does. So what could go wrong, right? This is a simple set of actions that are presented to the database in response to a query that an application might have sent, and a couple things could go wrong. So here on the right side, you see the bank balance starts out, has a value of 100. The first thing that happens is does that check and everything looks okay. It says yes, that check passes. So there's sufficient balance to pay $25. So this is you going to an ATM asking for a withdrawal and pays you that $25. So you now have it. And the new balance is calculated and that balance now gets written to your bank account. Okay, so after the new balance gets calculated, that last action of bank balance of 75 is that write operation that you see in that code on the left side. But now, what if after the ATM machine spitted out the $25, you went and yanked that ATM machine's power cord so that it could not send the write back? Okay, imagine you were that fast. Or there's a natural power failure. So the paying action and the write to the database is not atomic, right? They're happening in different systems. They might even be geographically spread across and bad things could happen in between those actions. So how do we make sure that this transaction is correct? Obviously we don't want that. Your bank would be very upset if that's how database systems work because they would be losing money if this happens. So we want this type of stuff to be protected and we'll talk about how. Here's another scenario, a different scenario showing a different type of problems that we also need to worry about. So this is not a power failure or things of that sort, but concurrent actions. So imagine you and your significant other both share this bank account and you have individual debit cards that allow you to debit from that same bank account. And you both go to two separate ATMs simultaneously, run this transaction. So both of you are running these sequence of actions to uh, withdraw $25. And sufficient balance is checked on both sides. You get paid. ATM spits out $25, your significant other gets paid. But now, because both of them read the original bank balance, both of them have calculated the new balance as being 75, right? Because everything looks correct. And then the first one writes, 
The second one overwrites that, and now the bank is short $25. Again, this is not an ideal situation for the banks. Banks would never use database systems, or enterprises wouldn't use database systems if these types of things are allowed to happen. So semantically, what we wanted is that we wanted the database application was sending this read and write request, right? That was written by some application code that is firing up these SQL queries to the database system. And now, through no fault of the application code writer, right? That's what the application code writer is doing, effectively writing the code that ends up sending those read write operations to the database. It feels the database system is just corrupting the data. So that's obviously not what we want of a database system. We want it to be well behaved. We want the final balance in this case to be $50. Okay, so how do we? deal with these bad uh, system systems behavior and have the database be coherent because ultimately the database is the keeper of the records. That's the master copy of what you have in the bank account and it has to be consistent in spite of all these different failure scenarios. So one system way, assuming that you don't have power failure, is to say, okay, the second type of option that I had where concurrent actions were corrupting each other is to say, I'm gonna have a very simple database system even if two people requested the queries at the same time, I will only run the one query at a time. I'm going to queue everything up, all the requests I get. I will run one query at a time, and uh, I can get a sensible, correct behavior for the scenario we just talked about. I can also start to do things like before a transaction starts, I can make a copy of the entire database, make all the changes there, and if the transaction completes successfully, so didn't have a power failure, all of that other kinds of stuff, uh, I will overwrite it with the new copy. Both of these are really bad. From, they will give you some form of correctness, but they're really bad from a performance perspective because it would be a very, very slow database system and you won't be able to quite use that. Right Today, when you go to Amazon and you're uh, checking out your shopping cart, you know ultimately something's going and issuing database uh, transaction records to debit from your to add to your shopping cart. Eventually, another transaction gets there, sent to your credit card account to record that that amount needs to be debited. And all of that works correctly, even if multiple people, or multiple account holders on the same credit card are doing the transactions at the same time, multiple shopping carts are getting created. So we really want to be able to do this at scale. We don't want to do one transaction at a time. We want to be doing thousands, tens of thousands, if not millions or billions of transactions at a time. Okay, so how do we do that? That's a really hard problem. Okay, we want better utilization for the database hardware. We want higher throughput, better response times. And of course, we want it to be correct so that the right thing happens. And we'll define what that notion of correctness is. And in many cases, you also want it to be fair. So if multiple transactions come at the same time, you want all of them to be given that equal chance to complete and not just say, I'm gonna hold two of you in the back forever and just let the other others go forward, right? That's not fair. You want to have some notion of fairness. Okay, And some systems may not have that. Sometimes you have priorities where you say, I want high priorities transactions to go through. But assuming you want fairness, you at least want the capability of having fairness. How you balance that in terms of partitioning your workload to let higher priority stuff go uh, is a different issue. right? But you do want the mechanism of fairness to be built into the database system. Okay, Questions so far in terms of what we are trying to achieve? Yep. Are you trying to solve? We will try to we will solve all the issues except the power failure issue, and the power failure issue will be solved. In you, we'll get to all of that solution later on. Where the power, there's a very subtle issue in the power failure stuff, which is with all the stuff we'll talk about in the next few lectures. We can make sure that the database record uh, ends up in the right state, but if the bank has paid you twenty five dollars and there's a power failure, there's extra action that is needed because that $25 has been a physical action. Everything else is a digital action. And to undo that action of paying you $25 when they should not have paid, the bank would have to then do a separate transaction in physical space where they'll send you a letter saying, whoops, we accidentally paid you $25, but here's what, what your bank account is, right? So there are other ways to do that. We, won't, we will be able to undo all the reads and writes if we don't uh, want them to happen. But you know, if the transaction is pay $25 is a physical action, you can't undo it. You'll undo that by doing other physical actions in the physical world. Okay. Similarly, if there's a transaction that fired a missile, you can't undo that missile. You can't bring that missile back. You have to send an apology letter or something else like that, right? So, uh, or something really bad. So it's like the undo for physical actions in transactions will require undo in the physical world, which we won't cover. 
And there are mechanisms to do that that are business related actions. You'll sometimes get a letter from your company saying, whoops, we made a mistake. Sorry about that. Here's what really happened. Oh, and by the way, he's a $10 gift card to make up for a mistake. Uh, but all the digital actions, the reads and writes, we will cast them into a very strict structure to guarantee very well-defined properties of correctness that we will uh, hold through the mechanisms we'll talk about today and going into the next few lectures. Okay, great question. Other questions? All right. So we want these arbitrary interleaving of operations and be correct. So before we go a little bit further, just want to solidify the notion of transactions. We're going to carry out these operations and the database, as we just talked about, is only concerned about the read and write operations to the database objects, right? These physical world actions of paying an amount or you know, uh, uh, starting uh, firing up a missile, stuff like that. Those we won't be able to repair if bad things happen. Okay. And there's a in the advanced database class, depending upon the material that's there, sometimes we'll talk about stuff like that and what are compensating transactions and stuff like that that might happen and what people might do uh, uh, as other ways. So, but for the purpose of this class, we'll just look at in this in this many ways of more limited scope. Reiterating what we talked about, we'll think primarily about read and write operations. You notice that in the code that I had, there was also a check, there was a subtraction, there was math and stuff like that. From the perspective of what we want to cover today for transaction management, all we care about is did an object get written, and did it get read? And do those reads and writes end up interfering with each other in bad ways? What are those bad ways and how do we prevent those bad ways? Okay. And how do we prevent those bad ways while allowing the maximum number of transactions to work on the system concurrently? That's the hard part, right? Because we already saw there's an easy way, which is to just do one transaction at a time. So you want to do better than that. All right. So it's only these objects, which we'll just refer to as variables A, B, and C. But if you want to have a simple model, you can think of it as a record. But inside a database system, and this we cover in the advanced database class, that A could be a column, which is uh, doing things at a finer level of granularity, or it could be a page, or it could be a file, or it could be a database. Some earlier versions of databases, uh, like Mongo at one point to do concurrency, would lock the entire database. They don't do that now, but the uh, the the uh, the size of that object or the uh, a b's and c's just refer to database app objects right for the purpose of today you can think about them as records and everything today and the next two classes will make a lot more sense if you wanted to pick a mental model for that okay all right uh, how does the database system know that a transaction has started and transaction has ended in SQL, you can explicitly put a begin transaction statement and an end transaction statement to tell the database system all the stuff that happened in between is a transaction. And in between could be multiple SQL queries. If you don't have a begin and end transaction, like all the stuff you've been doing in your homework, when you fire up a SQL query, implicitly the database system will put a begin at the beginning of the query and an end at the end of the query. But a transaction could be multi-queries, right? You can explicitly put begin and end. You could also put an explicit abort statement, which is to say, so and instead of end, it is called a commit, uh, which is to say everything I've done from the begin to here, please commit it and make its changes permanent. The other way to end that transaction is to say abort. So it may be I'm trying to make vacation plans. So I do a transaction to book flight tickets. Then I do a little bit of search in the code to find hotel reservations and find, whoops, don't have a hotel. So I could say, oh, abort this transaction. Then abort says, I did some work, reads and writes, but I don't think I can go further. Something doesn't look right. Abort this transaction and you could the application could be trying again. Right? So you could explicitly abort the transaction. And sometimes it may be that the database aborts for you because multiple transactions are happening at the same time. It detects some unsafe condition and says, whoops, I'm gonna abort this transaction for you and you get an abort code. From the transaction manager's perspective, the module that we are trying to understand and build today, it will be presented with a begin transaction, bunch of read-write actions, and eventually it will get a commit or an abort uh, action. And that's what we have to build in the system code to, pro to do transactions, right? So transactions could end by committing or they could end by aborting. Aborting means undo everything that might be done. Commit says everything I did, make it permanent, okay? So they can end in those two ways. And the abort could be self-inflicted as we talked about 
application could have explicitly put an abort call, or it could be that the database system has to abort for some reason to do all this safety guarantee that we talked about. And we'll look at different ways in which abort happens inside a database system over the next couple of lectures. Okay, many of you might have heard of this thing called ACID. It's a cool acronym uh, that was that the community came up with. There are a couple guys who came up with uh, 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 to say what are the properties we want of these transactions. Okay, and the properties are atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. So let's go through each one of those. Atomicity says. I have a transaction that did a whole bunch of read writes. And when I say commit, everything should have committed to the database. Or if I say abort, nothing should have happened. So it's like, I want this all or nothing property of this transaction, even though lots of reads and writes might have happened uh, in, this, in this transaction, right? It, it should feel like it's atomic, right? So it's very much like what you see with atomic instructions in, uh, in in processors, but now this is for multiple reads and writes. Those reads and writes may be spilling data to disk, so it's a much higher granularity, right? So much harder problem. Consistency says, uh, consistency is a little weird one, and I'm actually gonna go uh, to that last. Let me go to isolation and I'll come back to consistency. Isolation says, uh, if two transactions, like we had those two debit transactions happening, withdrawal of $25 from the bank account for you and your significant other, uh, we want those to not interfere with each other. It should feel like each transaction happened by itself. So even though we don't want to run one transaction at a time, we want the illusion of the system running one transaction at a time. It should feel like when my transaction ran, I had the whole system to myself and nothing else interfered with me. Okay, does that make sense? So it's like, I should feel no one interfered with my work. Durability says that if the database comes back to me and says, I've committed your transaction, after that, even if there's some failure, the disk fails or the memory fails, I should be able to recover that uh, state of the database with all the commit uh, information in that. So if I had changed the final value of that bank account to 75, the database said, I've committed your transaction, right? That commit call came back with a green signal. And then there's a power failure. When I bring back the machine, I should see 75 in there, not 100, which was the value it started with. Okay. Now going back to consistency, and I'll I waited for that because I'll just put a little labels around how we go about doing uh, things like that. Consistency is this weird thing that says if the database starts consistent as per some definition, then it should end in that same consistent state. Now that also seems vague, right? So what does it mean that the database started consistent? Uh, in SQL, there are things like, you can define a primary key foreign key, right? You've already done that. SQL also has these things called constraints where you can say at all, uh, 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 and uh, things called checks. So a check might say the price, I've got a price field in the table and that price should never be greater than a hundred. Okay, and the database is required whenever any updates happen to the database system to make sure those things hold true. So consistently really says, if the application has specified in the SQL DDL, all the things that they want the database to hold correct, then the database transaction shouldn't mess that up. And the main ways in which that happens is by checks, primary keys, and you can also define uh, 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 checks outside tables and other ways of the defining constraints and you really want all of that to hold, okay? So it's sort of weird, but it says if the application has defined the structure of the database correctly using everything that SQL allows with these checks, the transaction management or uh, everything that we do here shouldn't mess that up. If I said A plus B must always equal to 100 and someone modified A and modified B in the appropriate way uh, so that it is still equal to 100 in a single transaction, the transaction shouldn't violate anything and, and change that constraint. So it should maintain that correctness, okay? And we'll come back to it. It sounds a little vague, but it, in many ways that C was fitted into that ACID definition because the real key things that the database done is AID, but if the acronym was AID, then it didn't sound as good as ACID. And this was done when hippies were ruling the Bay Area and Europe and they wanted ACID everywhere. So that's, the, uh, 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 that's my understanding of how C was plugged in. 
We'll talk about different mechanisms and those are what you see in those blue bubbles. Uh, atomicity and durability will require this mechanism to redo and undo stuff. Oh, I've changed A and I've pushed it out to disk. I've pushed it out from my buffer pool to disk. Oh, but I need to abort that transaction. Uh, so how do I undo that? Oh, I committed a transaction with a new value of A, but it's still sitting in my buffer pool. It didn't make it to disk. I need to redo the disk copy. So the redo and undo mechanisms is what the A and D provides. We'll use things that we'll see today and in the next lecture that cover that. As I said, consistency is provided by making sure there are integrity constraints defined in your SQL DDL, and the transaction management system shouldn't violate that. Isolation is done by something called concurrency control, which we, which we will also look at, right? And locking and other mechanisms will come into play there. So we're going to dig into each one of these, so let's get started. All right, so that's our agenda. Dive into each of these four components. So atomicity of transactions. Uh, there are uh, two possible outcomes for executing a transaction. It either commits or it aborts, right? And aborts could be explicitly triggered by the application, or it could be something that the database says, something's unsafe, I need to abort you. Okay, and then that transaction could restart and reissue that SQL statement. And the DBMS needs to provide this all or nothing slash atomic property of these transactions. So let's make it a little bit more concrete. We've been playing around with examples. So we'll look at a couple of scenarios as we dig into this. We take $100 out of an account, uh, but the database system aborts the transaction before we transfer it, right? So we want to make sure uh, uh, that that is reflected correctly. Scenario two is we take $100 out of an account, but then there's a power failure before we transfer that. We've kind of seen both of these transactions, but just giving you more examples of what that should be. And you know we have to determine what's the correct state of the account after both these uh, transaction reports. So how can we do some of this stuff? Uh, the atomicity part can be done in one of two ways, logging and shadowing. One way is to log everything that we do. So if I'm recording all my actions, the minute I change a value from 100 to 75, I can record that my value was 100, I change it to 75. My before value was 100, after value is 75. Now I can take those logs and I can maintain those log records and I can store those log records in memory and at appropriate points, move it out to disk. Once it moves into disk, I know it is gonna be there. It will survive that power failure. If I don't think I can trust a single disk to hold that log, many times people will use disk mirroring. Remember we talked about disk mirroring a couple lectures ago? So if there are two disks that will have a copy of that same file, I write, but it's actually being written in twice, in two places. So that if one fails, I still have that other copy. But if both fail, you'd have to make a third copy and so on. So you have to decide what failure you can tolerate. But once a log hits the disk, you kind of know you can recover from that and reconstruct the state of the database. And we'll talk about the protocol Aries as we, uh, in two lectures from now, how we go and make that happen. But logging is the mechanism that most database systems will use to go and record the changes that are happening. Okay? All right? Does that make sense? Questions? Yeah, uh, how does this relate to like storing, like, like uh, at the storage level, you store log-based storage, right? So you, that, isn't this sort of- the No, no, don't confuse this with log-structured file system. Is that what you were thinking? It will look like that, but it's different. So a lot of this originated in the 70s and 80s. Uh, it's a file of records, but the records are going to be variable length, and the structure will have a certain set of common fields. Uh, but it, think of it as a file with a bunch of variable, uh, with some fixed length components and a whole bunch of variable. Length. It's sitting in a file that will often be called a log file, and it's basically going to be written sequentially from first to the end, and it'll be... It'll have its own buffer management. So it'll the recent pages will be in the buffer pool. At certain points, we will have to tell that uh, the buffer pool to say, I cannot commit this transaction till this page you have here in memory. That needs to hit to disk before I can commit this transaction. So we might hold the transactions commit. We won't return it till we are. But you can think of it as a file of records, just like a uh, regular uh, file, but it's got its special structure and schema. But if you had a, a DBMS with log structured storage and with this logging approach, we have a lot of redundant information. Yeah, so the question is, if I have a log structured file system, do I need logging? 
a log structured file system just works for that file. So in a database system, I may have 100 tables. A transaction may have updated in five different places. I need a global log logging mechanism to deal with that. So traditionally, what will be done, I have a log file, which is going to keep these changes for all the changes that are happening across, not just for a single file. So log structured file system does make sense. They have similar elements to the types of mechanisms that you're trying to do, redo and undo type of things, but they are on a per file basis. They may not be the right structure for it. They don't necessarily have all the buffer stuff. So it's good for certain applications and file system, but for database systems, we're going to need something different and we need it across different files, right? right. You might prune all operations too. So we'll talk about all of that as we go into details, but that's a good point. Why am I, you know, why do the operating systems guys talk about lock structured file systems? They have very similar elements to that. Can we use that? We, we need to worry about transactions that update records across multiple different tables, which may be in multiple different files sitting in the file system and still be atomic across those files. So it's different. So we, in many ways, we have to do a little bit. We have a harder problem to solve. Okay, great question though. Other questions? Okay, all right, so logging is used uh, by nearly every database system. What's the alternative, you might ask? Uh, in the very early days before logging and all the details about logging were really worked out, a very easy way to kind of do this stuff was to do shadow paging. It's like copy and write type of thing, right? And you'll see that in many applications, you'll see similar concepts. By the way, those of you who've taken operating systems or have dug into that are going to find a lot of common things between database systems and operating systems. We already hit latches and locks. They try to do different things, but a lot of database systems are going to be on larger things, lots of files, lots of data, and in some sense, the mechanisms are going to be different and in my view, often richer, okay? So shadowing is, okay, I'm gonna make a change to a record on a page, you know what, I'm just gonna make a new copy of the page and make the changes there. That way, if I need to undo stuff, I'll just go back to the old page. And I've got both my before and after copy for the entire page. Now, of course, some systems uh, uh, still do that, but it's not a good idea. It's less efficient, right? If I just wanted to change one byte in one page, I'm going to make the, an entire copy of the page. So that's obviously wasteful. I still need to go and clean things up and merge things up. Otherwise, before you know it, if I've got one page which has got a hot record, and let's say it's the counter that says, how many SKUs do I have for the pink Barbie doll that's really popular? Every time someone buys that Barbie doll, that counter will change. I'm gonna make copies and copies of the page, right? So if I've got a million Barbie dolls, I'll have a million copies, okay? By the way, counters in database systems aren't kept that way. They are done with more semantic uh, components using commutative action. That's just a side comment. Also an encouragement to take the advanced database class to uh, talk about more complex mechanisms to make transactions go even faster and better, okay? But you get the idea that shadow paging can very quickly, it's a cheap mechanism, easy to implement, but is problematic, logging is superior, and that's what most database systems use. So let's get to the C part, which has always been a little difficult to explain, but hopefully with this slide, it'll start to become better. It's essentially saying I have a contract between the database system and I as an application programmer uh, have a contract with you, the database system, that I'll tell you what I want in the application through my SQL statement, my primary key constraints, my checks and other things that I want in the system, and don't mess it up. If those constraints held before the transaction started, then the transaction ran, and it may have touched a million objects, read and write millions of objects across hundreds of tables. Once you say it's committed, all those constraints must still be true. Okay, if one of my constraints was the sum of all the columns in this A, uh, the, in the uh, price field is less than 100, that should still be true. If I said all the column A's should add up to be a million and exactly be a million, and lots of changes happen to different, uh, 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 to different values in that column A, that should still hold true, that sum should still be a million at the end of it. And I've specified that through my constraint, that should still, still hold true, okay? Now, the transaction management is not going to do anything different, as you'll see. We just have to make sure that the atomicity holds, the AID components hold, and constraint consistency will just get taken care of, right? Uh, we don't mess that up. So that's why it's, it's C is kind of like plugged into this asset stuff. The transaction mechanisms we'll talk about today in the next two lectures aren't gonna directly address C. It's the responsibility of the application programmer to define those constraints correctly. <laughs>
to make matters even more confusing, uh, a little while back, close to a decade ago, there's all this uh, uh, excitement about this thing called eventual consistency. Even though it has the word consistency, it has nothing to do with the consistency that we just defined here as a C in acid. That consistency was a model saying, oh, these transactions are hard. In distributed systems, it becomes very tough to do that. Though now we have figured things out and how to do things in distributed systems well too. But at that time when people were building these uh, systems and largely the systems were being built by people who hadn't taken the database course, that was the problem. Uh, they said the best way we can make this happen is to be eventually consistent. So let the changes happen. And then eventually if A, two transactions made changes to A, eventually they would be the same. So if that $25 withdrawal from two accounts happening simultaneously, it's like eventually they will end up to be 50, but for a while, even though both have been paid $25, you read the value, you will see 75. So the eventual consistency model is, don't trust the value, eventually it will be right. But the question from the application perspective is, how long do I have to wait for it? And how do I know when something is right or not? And there were early days when people were building these uh, applications with eventual consistency where you'd have your Facebook app, you'd post a message, and your friend would see it, you would refresh here, and it would be gone because eventually it would be there, but it just fetched from a different server that hadn't gotten your message, right? Your first connection was made to server one, second connection for refresh went to something else, it hasn't gotten the update. So as you can imagine, that became very hard for application programmers to do the whole point of having database systems or data platforms deal with transactions is so I, as an application programmer, don't have to deal with it. So it's now universally accepted that it's a pretty bad idea unless there's you have very strict requirements for performance that require you to do nothing but just that, okay? But it is not the go-to way to build data platforms by saying, you, the application person, start worrying about transactions. The bunch of systems still use eventual, but I'll briefly flash the spanner paper, which globally is using things that are even stronger than ACID. And then again, if you take the advanced database class, we talk about stuff like that over there, is there. So it's not that systems don't use that today. I'm just saying, in my view, it's not a good idea to use that as a default way to build a data platform. There's still some reasons why you may want to do that, but it's not the way you should say, I'm gonna make my database by design eventual consistency because I didn't think of doing other ways of doing full transactions. Their performance, obviously you can get more performance with eventual consistency, there's no doubt about that. Sorry for this question, but- I'll close my ears, everyone close their ears, no. Basically the question is like, what, so, so what is eventual consistency? Because I don't eventual consistency says, eventually all the values will be the right values. So it will feel like you got your transactions, but for a while you may see inconsistent values. So that's what eventual consistency is. So an application gets their, get, like it, it reaches the DBMS and it might just be wrong. So yeah, as I said, you may see 75 for a while when it should be 50. Both of you, are, you're standing next to each other on two side-by-side -side ATM machines. Both of you got your 25 bucks and you will say, oh, 75 is in the bank, okay. which is not true. And the bank will say, you know what? It was actually 50. We sent you that. Eventually it will be the right amount, right? But as you can see, it's hard, right? You don't want that in your application. Yep. You. Uh, other, another question? Oh. No, there are other. Dynamo has eventual consistency. Other systems too have eventual consistency models. Database that like, uh, what's it called? Put this term out. Put this term out, yes. Uh, but but there, there was a whole time where people were saying, we don't need SQL, we don't need transactions, no SQL, eventual consistency. That hasn't quite worked out for those people, okay? So I'm not saying there's no more for eventual consistency. I'm saying that's not what you should design for by default uh, unless you know what you're getting into. And now you're going to have to put the complexity in the application, okay? So there is still some place for it, but not like that's not the default setting. So, all right, let's go find my mouse again. There we go. All right, so isolation of transactions. So we are still on I. Use a submit transaction. Each transaction executes as if it is running by itself. And obviously, it's an easier programming model, as we talked about. And the DBMS is going to do its stuff to give this one at a time or isolation uh, as a principle. So uh, how does it do that? There are two classes of methods. And again, today, I'm just going to outline it at a high level. We'll get into the details of it uh, in the next lecture. The two classes, one is pessimistic, which is to say, 
Even before I let a read and write happen, I'm going to be pessimistic. If I think something bad's going to happen, I'm going to hold you back, hold you that transaction that I think is going to start this bad action back. Okay, And we'll see how that happens in a little bit with, with a couple of mechanisms. Uh, the second way uh, is basically to uh, do something called uh, uh, optimistic concurrency, which is to say, I think every life is good. I'm going to let every transaction go through. I'll still provide the isolation principle so that they don't interfere with each other. But I'm going to do that by checking, assuming everything is going to go well. So it's like, everyone go do your reads and writes. I'll keep track of it. Go make your changes. But before you're ready to commit, I will do some checks to see if you guys interfered with each other. All of you guys, all of you transactions that were running together simultaneously. So optimistic says, most transactions don't conflict with each other. So I can get a higher performance system by being optimistic that most things will work out. It will still be correct. So it'll make sure bad things don't happen, but it's a different philosophy. Okay. All right. So, <clears throat> let's start digging into a couple examples. Now, as we know, transactions are going to be cast in terms of these read-write operations. And now you're starting to see some of the begin and commit calls that are coming in. So, T1 is a transaction that's subtracting, that moving $100 from bank account A to bank account B. And T2 is a transaction that's adding 6% interest to all the bank accounts. And assume this is a small bank, so it just has two bank accounts, okay? Also keeps the example simple. Uh, what's the possible outcome of running these two? There are two possible outcomes. One is, uh, assume both A and B start with $1,000. If I run A followed by B or B followed by A, I'm going to get two different uh, uh, execution strategies, but eventually A plus B should be 2,000 and 6% of that means that the total bank account across those two banks should be 2,120, right? So that's what we want to end up with. Now, what we are going to look at next, I'm just going to jump into this, is with just these two transactions, I could have a correct isolation property being held by either running the first transaction first and running the second transaction first, right? There are two possible outcomes. T1 runs first, followed by T2 or vice versa. And so here you can see one example where the value of A uh, is 954 and B is 166. That will correspond to having done the $100 transfer first, then adding 6%. And the other one is doing it the other way around, okay? So either one of those by the isolation principle is correct. If both transactions are in the system at the same time, we are okay, we as a transaction management system are okay in picking that order. So let's just look at it more uh, visually and that might make sense. There's this notion of a serial execution. And the serial execution diagram that we'll see in the next 10 or 15 slides, all are going to have time going from top to the bottom. So imagine you are the machine and you're watching transactions come at you. And isolation basically says, if this execution is such that you can show me, prove to me that no matter what you do, whichever order you allow the transaction, it feels like one happened before the other. And that one happened before the other could be all of T1 happened followed by T2 in this case, which is the example on the left, which is when you end up with A is equal to 954 and B is 1166 or T2 followed by that. Both of them are correct. But if you are going to interleave these reads and writes for these two transactions, the database better end up with one of these two correct end states. Which one? Doesn't matter, but it should be one of those two, not, a, not something else. Question. Why are we allowed to do two transactions exactly in parallel? Like, shouldn't, like, obviously this is like an example, but like if it was a bank, like one of them would happen first, right? No, that's the whole point. So the question is, why are we doing this in parallel? That's the whole point. Uh, right now, this is a serial execution, so T1 is happening after T2 in time. But what we want to do is to imagine I've got two cores in the server, and today's servers have 40 cores, and database machines sometimes have hundreds of machines. I don't want to be just running one transaction at a time. I want to be able to do as many actions at any given point in time. I want to do as many things as possible, right? Because I want to use all the hardware I have access to. That way, I can get more transactions in the system, higher throughput, and lower latency potentially. 
basically lowering the standard for correctness here? No, no, no. We will not lower the standard. So hold on. We will not lower the standard. We are definitely changing the standard a little bit to say any permutation of T1 followed by T2 is allowed. T2, T1 and T2 can be interchanged as long as we can prove one did all of its work before the other. So hold on for two slides. You're right. It's like, why is it not only one possible way that T1 should be followed by T2? If we did that, then we would allow less parallelism in the system, okay? So you're going to relax the strict notion of what is correct. And this is where there's this notion of strict uh, uh, serializable, which will say the transactions should feel like they retired in the way in which they happen in the physical world. We'll talk about that in the next class a little bit. And we'll talk about it a lot more in the advanced database class, okay? First, let's get a little bit right. And this is, by the way, what most database systems do today. They will take this slight liberty of rechanging it. Because it's also like T1 and T2 issued at the same time. What does it even mean for it to be issued at the same time? They may be in different uh, cities. Even if you're sitting next to each other, it's not as if you would be pressing the button exactly at the same second because that doesn't happen, right? So it's like, what does simultaneous mean? So we're going to be a little bit more relaxed. All we have is to say for us to be have this proper isolation, the final values should be one of these two, not a third value. Look at this slide here first. Yep. So here, T, uh, T1 starts and does its subtraction of 100. So now A has $100 already removed. T2 starts and gives 6% interest to the two bank accounts, but the bank account value for A that it is looking at is $100 short, and so it ends up with a value of 2114 as the sum total, which is $6 off from what that original amount should be, okay? So what we want to allow is these two, the interleaving in the previous slide that is safe, where you end up with the correct value, even though there's interleaving, but this is an example of an unsafe interleaving where you ended up with the wrong value, right? So this is fine. Sorry, I, uh, I was here on the wrong slide here. Uh, this is fine. And the question is, how do we determine that this is okay? This type of interleaving of actions across different transactions is okay, but this one is not. Okay? So let's look at how we go about doing that. So there's this formal notion of serial schedule that says a schedule that does not interleave any of the actions. So we saw that, right? A serial example of a serial schedule was one where you just had uh, all the T1s like here is a serial schedule. So if we go back, this is a serial schedule, T1 followed by T2, or T2 followed by T, uh, uh, T1. Okay, now the thing that we are trying to get to, the harder part, is an equivalent schedule. So here was a schedule that we saw that was correct. It is not serial, but as we'll see, this is correct. And we want to look at this schedule and say the one on the uh, uh, left is equivalent to the serial schedule on the right. We want to be able to show that happens, and in which case we'll say that schedule is safe, and that's allowed. So the notion of equivalent schedule says allow some interleaving, and as long as you can prove that this interleaving is safe, and the proof of safety is going to be by saying all these actions are equivalent to some serial schedule, in this case, one of those two, T1 followed by T2 or T2 followed by T1, you are okay. You will end up with the correct answer. Okay, So it sounds like magic, but there's a very simple way to go uh, uh, figure that out. And this is the part that you were asking about. It's like, okay, but why are the two correct states of the database? And that's really what we are relaxing a little bit in this notion of serializable. And as I said, there's a social of strict serializable where that real world effect is taken into place and it's stricter. But for the purpose of this class, we are going to work with this notion that we just have to prove it equivalent to one of the many equivalent serial schedules. And if you have two transactions, there are only two possible outcomes. If there were three, T1, T2, T3, it could be, first transaction could be either one of those, there are three possible combinations, then two, then one, right? So you, you, you get that factorial effect. We're going to think about these rewrites in terms of conflicting actions that can happen between these objects, uh, like the A's and the B's and the C's. So we are going to have, we call these things anomalies, and there are three different types. A read could interfere with, a, a transaction reads an object and something else writes to it, or 
a transaction writes an object and someone else reads that object. The third one is two transa transaction one writes to an object and the other transaction also writes to that object. What is missing from this combination is read read, right? Which is obviously not a conflict. If I'm just reading this two transactions, if I've just got a copy that's read only, many transactions could read it, you're not gonna conflict with each other. Right? It's a, it's a read-only copy. All right, so let's take these read-write conflicts and uh, go look at that. Here is a schedule in which there is a read of an object A followed by a write of an object A as these actions got interleaved. And so that would be an example of a read-write uh, conflict. There are other conflicts in the schedule too, but, but what's the downside of this read-write object uh, conflict? Transaction one read the value A, T2 ran, and then T1 reached that value and got a different value, right? So it was 10 before, T2 made it 19, T1 reads it again, and obviously it is not seeing the isolation principle, right? In the same transaction, if I read the value twice, I should see the same value unless someone else interfered with me. So it violates the isolation principle, and so this is bad. Okay. All right. Let's uh, look at uh, the, and so that's called unrepeatable read because when you have a read-write conflict, same transaction reads the value twice, it's going to see different values. A dirty read is I read a value, let's say it is 10, write it to be 12. Someone else reads the value, which is 12. So far, no problem. But what happens a little bit later is that transaction T1 aborts. And when transaction T1 aborts, that value 12 should never have been read because it didn't get committed to the database. It was an intermediate value, which is getting thrown away, right? That's what an abort uh, should do. And so now transaction T2, when it was reading the value A, read a dirty value, which should have never been in the database because of that abort. So that's called a dirty read, right? A write-write conflict is T1 is writing a value, uh, T2, is also writing that value. And when uh, T1 writes another value B, T1, it feels like it's writing $10. Imagine A and B are now columns, and it's updating a record where $10 is in Alice's account, and it's column one is 10, uh, uh, the account uh, amount, and B is the name of the person. It thinks it's adding 10 to Alice, but the other conflict over there is writing to that same record, 19 and Bob. So you have 10 in there, 19 and 10, Bob got written to that same record. And then you have this uh, Alice uh, B that is written. That update of 19 and Bob just got overwritten. So transaction two did its work, but its values just got overwritten. So it lost its update. It never got made it, made it to the database. Okay. So the we'll use these properties to then define how to go make this equivalent schedule work. There are two types of uh, serializability, conflict serializability, which we'll talk about next. Something called view serializability. Since we are running out of time, I might just totally go skip that piece, but I'll briefly allude to what that does. Okay, won't grill you with exam questions on view serializability, okay? So it's okay if you don't totally get that. Conflict serializability is what database systems implement, and let's just jump into that. Then let me just go with this graph form here to make it even more easier to understand. So what we'll do is the following. We'll take operations that we have, and here's the schedule that we have. We will start going through that and enumerate all possible conflicts, read, write, 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 and write, read. Okay, those three conflicts. We'll create a graph called the dependence graph. So I've got two nodes in that graph, T1 and T2. Every time a transaction comes in, a new node will be added. So the graph will have as many transactions that are active in the system at any point in time. Now I'll just start going through the schedule and start marking all the conflicts. And I start with the first conflict that I see, which is a read-write. Doesn't matter what the conflict is, as soon as I have one of those three types of conflict, read, write, 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 or write, read, I'm going to put an arrow there. So the first conflict A uh, is on this object A, and it goes from T1 to T2 because T1 happens before T2 in the schedule, right? So I'll draw a directed arc from T1 to T2. Okay, does that make sense? 
So really simple. I'm going to just walk through this for every conflict that I have. I'll draw a directed graph in the order in which this conflict is happening. All right. Now I go and find the next conflict, which is this right followed by read, and I will do that. So the proof is really simple. You take a schedule. If you walk through it and draw a line for every read-write, write-write, or write-read conflict, and if it, there's a cycle in that graph, you have a bad schedule. That schedule will violate the isolation principle. That schedule should never have been allowed to run in the database system. In the next class, we'll see mechanisms that you can use to prevent that from ever happening. Okay, does that make sense? If you didn't get anything else because of that bug in the slide, that's the main thing I want you to get from this isolation principle. What direction do the edges go? The edges go in the time order. See, so look at the right followed by read, the red line that is shown here right now. It's going from T1 to T2, right? The read, the write in A happened before the read in T2. So I will draw a directed line from T1 to T2 saying some action in T1 happens before the action in T2, which means T2 better not do stuff that is the other way around because now I've got a contradictory state that I'm going to end up with, okay? So the serial schedule is the schedule, is the, the time on the left side is the order in which the database is seeing those actions. And it's going to construct this graph. And what we'll see in the next class is the minute it starts to say this second stuff, which is going to cause this arc to complete, it'll stop. It won't let, it'll basically, not let this thing proceed beyond the right of V because it says, if I allow this right to happen, this arc to form, I will have a conflict. So this line, it'll pause that. It'll uh, stop transaction T1 from proceeding with the techniques we'll talk about in the next class. Okay? Yep. So does it need to restart? Does it need to what? Does T1 need to eventually restart? Or... Yeah, and then it may need to abort something or delay something. So we'll we'll talk about that, right? So there are uh, sometimes where it may just say, you know what, I need to abort, uh, uh, and I can't go any further. All right, so it's really that simple. We will construct this graph, and now we have this beautiful proof that says, how do I uh, have correct isolation uh, properties? All right, so here is uh, three transactions, just to show this in a slightly more complicated way. Uh, as I walk down, the first conflict is that read to write. There are other conflicts in there. There's a WA and T1 to read in A. I'm not showing every possible conflict in there, but both of them induce a arc from T1 to T2, right? It's just a hazard. Uh, and then there are other conflicts, but that will just redo that same line. You don't have to redraw that line multiple times. One arc is, one arc is enough, right? That's all this is showing. As you go further down, we see another conflict uh, from T2 to T1, okay? And that's all there is in here. So this basically says, in this schedule, even though there's a bunch of interleaving going on between the three transactions, this you can prove to be correct. And can you guess what's the correct serial schedule? Look at the graph. Yeah, it's going to be the order of that graph. T2, it's like T2 happened first, then T1 happened, then T3 happened. Whoops. It's as if that was the serial order in which they were executed and we were just running one transaction at a time. And that's the whole idea. Now, if you get why this graph makes sense, it's trivial, but it took a little while for people to figure this out. It wasn't that trivial. And that's what many of these beautiful ideas are. They seem simple only in retrospect. Okay? So forget about everything I said with that bug in the slide. This, if you get it, you understand how isolation works. Okay? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, and we'll talk about aborts and other kinds of special handling in there. But what is true is that even before the abort, if you start to see a cycle, you know you will end up in a bad situation, so you need to stop it. Right, because time is evolving. I, as the database transaction manager, 
if I'm at this point in time and I've been told, should I admit this read of B, I have to make a decision. If I'm this pessimistic transaction management system, pessimistic isolation management, if I, 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 I will have to decide whether to let that happen or not. If I'm optimistic, I'll say, let it go. And in the end, I will figure out, right? So that's the difference between the pessimistic and the optimistic. Yep. So is this schedule being created before it happens? or is like It is being created while it's happening, oh. right? So you can imagine something like this is happening in the system. Uh, third step is run. Uh, we start with the begin on P1, then read of A is done, write of A is done, system says, I can let you go. Then uh, when the write of A comes, system will say, you know what? I need to put an arc in this graph. So as time is progressing, these arcs are being done. The uh, reads and writes are being presented to the system as time evolves. So it doesn't know if it's and that's the difference between the pessimistic method and the optimistic. Pessimistic will say, first time I think there's a problem, I'm going to stop you. And we'll see how in the next class. And optimistic says, I'll let everything go, but I know how to get you back to a safe place if bad things had happened. OK? So, so is this a optimistic? This is not optimistic. This is just saying, how do I detect that something is good or bad? But right? this is the mechanism. Yep. So does this mean that even if there's a cycle, it could still be OK? Uh, if it is a cycle, it is not OK. How do I find the cycle? When do I find the cycle is where the difference is. Do I find the cycle as soon as it is formed? Or do I find the cycle after I let everything go? Yeah. So that's basically the whole theory of saying, is this equivalent uh, to that order or not? Uh, so here is another example. And this is where we are getting into this view serializability. And kind of what is happening over here in, uh, here what's happening is A is getting $10 removed from it. And there's a, uh, sum that is being calculated, that's getting printed out over here. Of course, there are uh, problems with this transaction because that one causes the arc from T1 to T2. And then you have this transaction, so this is not serializable. But if instead of the second transaction doing a sum of the two transactions, if the code in there was only about saying, find the number of transactions that have values, account values greater than 100, the fact that it is a cycle doesn't matter from the semantics of that second transaction. At a very high level, that's what view serializability is. It'll, if you knew something about the semantics of what was happening, you will admit a few more types of schedules that you would not otherwise. And as I said, that's all I want you to know. For this class, if you didn't get that, that's OK. Let it go. We're not going to talk too much about view serializability. Uh, it'll just allow certain types of cycles because it says, I think the application is OK. All right. And there's a formal definition of it if you're interested in looking at it in terms of what it allows. It basically uh, allows a few more schedules than a strictly serial schedule will allow. All right, so config serializability is the main thing that uh, we want you to know about. All right, pictorially, here's the universe of all possible schedules, including the bad ones, the ones we don't want to happen. Uh, sorry, here serial is schedule is that strict serial stuff which we talked about. P1 followed by T2, and that's the only thing that I'll allow. Config serializable is where we are allowing a few more combinations. And view serializable is where you might have a little bit more by way of this application performance. OK? And there are many more layers in there. And we'll uncover some of those in later classes. And again, a lot more in the detail class. So we still have one more letter to cover, which is the D, which is the durability, right? We did atomicity consistency, isolation, which is where we spend most of the time today. And the last one is durability, which will cover really fast. Uh, durability, we have a full lecture coming on it, on this in two, uh, the second class from now, which is about making sure that the changes that we make to the system, we're making changes to A's, the B's, and the C's, and stuff like that, just in memory, right? If you're updating a column value or a record, that's sitting in the buffer pool. Uh, but what happens if you have a power loss and memory is volatile, so those changes never made it to disk, but you might have committed that transaction. So durability is the aspect that says, if the database commits a transaction, oh, by the way, the database is allowed to use a buffer pool because that's an efficient way to build data processing systems. Right? You don't want to go to disk every time. You want a buffer pool because buffer pool accessing data in buffer pool is just so much faster than accessing things on disk. Uh, but if the database says it's committed, you want to make sure that if there's power failure, 
you can get the right values in the database. So durability will do that by making sure when the commit happens, it's going to make sure certain things get written to disk, and it'll try to do very small amounts of forced write to disk so that it can provide this durability property. Okay, And as I said, in two lectures from now, we'll talk about that. So that's basically what ACID looks like. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, we can talk about that offline. The answer is the principles will probably apply. It's like I have volatile storage and non-volatile storage, and I can apply this principle of durability across any of those systems. Yeah, yeah, the same principles do apply. Yep. So are the logs and shadow pages in memory still? The logs, sorry? Are, are these are the logs and the shadow pages? Yeah, the logs will be kept in memory. We'll get to that in two lectures from now. The log records that we create will be kept in memory too, but at appropriate times, we will actually flush them out to disk to guarantee the durability property. So, so what happens if we... we... We'll talk about that. What happens if the log fails? That's the whole lecture, two lectures from now. It's a full lecture. I can't give you a 10-second answer. The 10-second answer is that we will make sure that absolutely what must be written to disk is written. And if we write the wrong thing, we will look at the value and undo if we need to. We'll do one of two things with stuff we write on disk, either redo the operation because it's inconsistent with what was in memory or undo it because we wrote something that we should not have written, okay? So we'll do redo and undo logic on, on those. Okay, so here's the conclusions. Uh, concurrency control and recovery are amongst the most important functions. The transactions are super important. Uh, that's a quintessential definitional component of database systems. And if you go back to the early days of database systems, that's why they started getting adopted in uh, enterprises because they allowed all this record keeping. Now I need five minutes to go over a couple things, but before that, we've talked about this a few times that there are there's still a lot more things you can do with transactions. There's this breakthrough paper that came out from Google called Spanner. By the way, before that, they were doing eventual consistency stuff in many parts, and they realized, wow, application programmers can't quite do that. So they actually built a very hard thing, which is a globally distributed system that can do transactions, where the transactions could be touching objects in their database, which is distributed. So it might touch an object in London, touch an object in the US, and commit that transaction across the globe as one transaction and do that fast and efficiently. And the reason they did that is if they kept the eventual consistency stuff, all kinds of application programmer bugs were showing up, like the ad system would report wrong things. It would tell the same advertiser, Procter & Gamble, for example, in London, this is how many impressions we showed, and the same campaign in US would show a different number, and these two guys get on the phone and say, what the heck's happening? What impressions did we really show? You want that answer to be precise because someone's paying money for it. Uh, that was one of the big reasons why they went and built that. It's a beautiful system, requires atomic clocks, where you need satellite syncing across the data centers so that the two clocks are not out of sync. CockroachDB was formed by people from Google who uh, worked on this and have a version of it that doesn't require satellite clocks. But fascinating field. There's still a lot of new things that are happening. Bonus round, I'll leave this link in the slides. If you want to, we've talked about all kinds of different models and levels of consistency, but there's a lot more and you can play around with that chart. But I want to spend a couple minutes on the uh, project three, which is on query execution. And the overview of this project is we essentially have, uh, these are the different components of bus stop as you've gotten to know and love over time. Project three is related to the optimizer and the query execution and project four that's coming will be query execution and the transaction management piece. Okay, so what is project three? You're going to add access methods, two different access methods, sequential scan and index scan. You will also do insert, delete and updates. So these are the operator stuff that you're going to add. You're going to add these as uh, new operators that are in the system. Two different types of join, nested loops join and hash join. And there's some miscellaneous window aggregation function, limit, sort, and top K. You'll also touch the optimizer. So there's already an optimizer in bus stop. And uh, uh, to convert a query, if a query has both an order by and a limit, you can convert it to a with a simple transformation into a top K query. Right? So that'll give you a chance to look at how do optimizers work. If you see a nested loops, that's often a bad idea. So in the optimizer, you will write a rule to convert nested loops to hash join. Okay, because those are typically much faster 
And similarly, with sequential scan to index scan, if an index exists, don't do a sequential scan, go use an index scan. These are, think of it as the heuristic stuff that we talked about in the optimization stuff, right? Not cost-based heuristics, just rules-based, okay? Uh, the leaderboard will require making deeper changes to the optimizer. So even if you have awesome code from project one and project two, you're guaranteed not to get good high stats on the leaderboard unless you go add new optimization rules. And you'll, uh, that's all described in the project. You'll be adding rules to window aggregation and, and top K. Uh, quick tips, start with the easy stuff, the insert and sequential scan. That's the easiest stuff. Get it right before uh, you go uh, do other things with it. And the key thing is uh, now you can actually go and run Bustub in, uh, in the browser. So I'm going to close this here and whoops. Quit PowerPoint, don't need that anymore. And if you go look at Bustub now, you can actually uh, uh, go and run bust up in the browser. Let me go find the link here. Yep. Uh, Chi, who's just an awesome programmer, has written this version which completely runs in VASM code in the browser and it's already loaded with some tables in there and you can start to do things like uh, select star uh, from the mock table and do things like that. Whoops, where's my semicolon? and you can start to run stuff. So you can use this to test if your code works. Our solution is sitting behind that, yep. You should like, if you're having, one thing that can really help is like explaining on some queries and then like yeah. seeing, and seeing how that differs from your query plan and how like what potential parts of your code or like what executors may be breaking. Yeah, so the, use this as a reference don't use grade scope as a way of doing your debugging. Write your tests, otherwise you will not do well in this project, okay? So hopefully it's a fun project. Start with the simple stuff. It may seem like a lot. Start with the simple stuff and you'll be surprised how quickly you start knocking things off. Okay, all right, thank you. TJ, Shubham, hit it. Shit is gangsta. Uh, gangsta. Uh, bad boys are gangsta. Uh, you ain't nothing but gangsta. Uh, yeah, yeah. Now listen, I'm the poppy with the motherfucking hookup. 28 a gram, depending on if it's cook up. You ain't hit a mob yet? Still got you shook up? I smack you with the bottom of the clip and tell you, look up. Show me where the safe's at before I blow your face back. I got a block on taps, the feds can't trace that. Style is like tamper proof, you can't lace that. The Dominican, or you could call me Dominican. Black skelly, black leather, black suede Timberlands. My all black 38 is send you to the pearly gates. You get consignment trying to skate, and that's your first mistake. I ain't lying for that cake, your fam will see you wake. My grams is heavyweight, then ran through every state. When they ask me how I'm living, I tell them I'm living great.